So starting back up after the break, we have Albin Bernhardson from ARM, and they're going to talk about the work they've done for Vulkan synchronization for WebGPU. Albin, please. Hi, I'm Albin Bernhardson. I'm an engineer at ARM, and um, I do a lot of work with developers to help them optimize their Vulkan API usage, especially for mobile devices, and especially when it comes to synchronization, as that's an area developers often tend to struggle with. Um, it has a tendency to get a little bit complex, which is an understatement. So I'll be talking about WebGPU. So many of you are probably already familiar, but this is vulcanized, not WebGPUized. So some introduction is in order. Uh, WebGPU is essentially sort of a successor to WebGL with some asterisks. And uh, it's an API for accessing the GPU that's primarily intended to be used on the web, hence the name. But you can also use it in native applications. WebGPU has several differences to WebGL, and most of those differences mirror the differences between OpenGL and Vulkan. So we've gotten rid of a bunch of global state. Uh, we keep that state in command buffers and some in pipelines. Uh, we've changed the resource binding model. So we now bind multiple resources together in what are called bind groups, which it's really just another name for descriptor sets, Vulkan. Similarly, we uh, bundle our rendering commands together into render passes, and we now finally have access to compute. But WebGPU is not simply Vulkan on the web. There are some differences. Uh, first of all, there's lots of differences in features and extensions that are available in Vulkan that you don't get in WebGPU like DRS, ray tracing, bind list, geometry shaders, the list goes on. And this may change in the future as the API matures and more functions and optional features become available. Hopefully, geometry shaders stay out. Uh, unlike in Vulkan, there is no explicit memory management. And importantly for this talk, there is no explicit synchronization. You just submit your commands and it all just kind of works out. No pipeline barriers, no events, no semaphores, no offenses. But of course, it doesn't work by magic. If you don't have to care about synchronization, someone else has to. And in the case of WebGPU, that someone else is the browser you're running in, or more specifically, the WebGPU implementation that your browser uses. Uh, in the case of Chromium, that implementation is called Dawn. It's available at this URL. You can check it out for yourself if you want to. There is also a GitHub mirror if you prefer that. And Dawn implements WebGPU on top of Vulkan. Also on top of Metal and DX12, but I don't care. I'm here for Vulkan. So Dawn has the task of taking a WebGPU command buffer that the user has recorded, which contains no synchronization information whatsoever, and somehow converting that into a Vulkan command buffer that contains all of the necessary pipeline barriers to avoid any synchronization issues like race conditions or cache issues and all the other nasty stuff that you get when you don't do synchronization properly. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to have a look at uh, an example render pass that the user records in WebGPU. So we begin by starting our render pass, which contains some information about our color attachments and depth attachment. Then we set some common pipeline that we use to render our meshes. Uh, we set some common uh, resources like camera matrices or the texture atlas. Then we start rendering each mesh. And to do that, we set a vertex buffer and some resources that is unique to that mesh, like some model matrix maybe. Then we can draw, and we can do that for every mesh in our render pass. And of course, we can have multiple render passes in our command buffer. So as the user is recording a command buffer, we're going to keep track of all of the resources that are being used. And we're going to keep them in what we call a sync scope. And a sync scope is really just a list of every single resource that is being used and also how it is being used. So for instance, when we begin our render pass, we get our color attachment on our depth attachment. And we're going to keep track of those. We add it to the list. And we mark them as being used as a color attachment and a depth attachment. We do the same for our camera matrices that we keep in a uniform buffer. We have our texture that we are sampling in the shaders, and our vertex buffers and our uni buffer, uniform buffers for each mesh. Then 
when the user submits the web GPU command buffer to the queue, that's where we're going to go ahead and actually record the Vulkan command buffer. And we're just going to loop through every command in the web GPU command buffer and record the corresponding Vulkan command. And usually there's a pretty simple one to one mapping. But in the case of begin render pass, before we record the actual begin render pass command, we're going to loop through every single resource in our sync scope, every texture, every buffer, and we're going to insert that pipeline barrier that we need. So how exactly do we do that? Well, each resource is going to have a function for recording a pipeline barrier. It looks a little bit different than this. This is sort of like pseudocode. Uh, but it takes in a texture usage, or in the case of a buffer, a buffer usage, which is really just telling us how is this resource going to be used in the upcoming render pass. And we're going to convert that to everything we need for a pipeline barrier. So we need an access mask. We need an image layout. We need pipeline stage. So let's take an example. If we have a color attachment, we need to convert that into an access mask. And well, it's pretty obvious. It's the color attachment, right? Bit. Uh, we need an image layout, which again, pretty obvious. It's a color attachment. And we need a pipeline stage, which is pretty obvious. It's a color attachment. And now we have our barrier, but not quite, because you need two access masks in the barrier, a destination access mask, which is what we recorded here which determines how the resource is going to be used in the upcoming render pass. But we also need a source access mask for how it was used previously. So to do that, we're going to keep track of not just what the upcoming usage is, but we're also going to have a variable in a resource that keeps track of what was the previous usage, the last usage. And this is the usage that we're going to use to determine all of our source access mask, our old image layout, and our source pipeline stages. And there we go. Now we are ready to actually insert our pipeline barrier. And this is sort of a simplified basic way of how Don used to handle synchronization. And it's a fairly common way. I would argue probably the most common way in some sense. Now, the tracking of resources may differ a lot between implementations. You may be using a render graph. You may be tagging resources, giving hints. On the tracking stage, there is a lot of different implementations. but at the end of the day, a lot of implementations boil down to this one single line of code, get pipeline stage based off of usage. This is the way it used to be done in Dawn. It's the way it's currently done in a different open source web GPU implementation. It's the way it's done in plenty of Vulkan applications and even in highly successful commercial game engines. So it really is a ubiquitous line of code, which let's hope there are no issues with it. That was foreshadowing. So I went through how we did this for a color attachment, but let's look at another example, a texture binding, which is really just a texture that's being sampled in a shader. Again, the access mask is trivial. It's being read in a shader. The image layout is trivial. It's being read in a shader. The pipeline stage is, well, it's probably the fragment shader, right? We're probably sampling the texture in the fragment shader, but not necessarily. It could be vertex or compute or geometry or tessellation control, tessellation evaluation, task shader, mesh shader, ratio. I ran out of space on the slide. Uh, in WebGPU, it's a little bit simpler because we don't support most of those stages. We might have to support some of them in the future. Uh, but still, it's one of fragment, vertex, or compute. But that doesn't solve the problem. We don't know which one it actually was. All we know is it's a texture. It's being sampled in a shader. Which stage? We don't know, but it's one of them. So let's just put let let's just put all of them. It'll work. We definitely covered our use case. It will be correct. What's the worst that can happen? Here's the worst that can happen. Let's take a very simple application that has a very simple frame. It consists of only two render passes. In the first render pass, we render a shadow map. In the second render pass, we do our main pass where we perform our lighting. So we'll obviously be sampling our shadow map. And this is what a frame looks like. But well, it's a bit simplified because really each render pass consists of multiple draw calls. And each draw call consists of some vertex work and some fragment work. So really, this is what a frame looks like. And this is probably the way that a lot of people would conceptualize the rendering pipeline. And it's not wrong. Unless you're on a tile GPU, in which case it is quite wrong. Uh, on a tile GPU, it looks something more like this. We're going to take 
all of the vertex work for the entire render pass and do that all in one big go, one big chunk. And when that is fully done, we're going to take all of the fragment work for the entire render pass and do that in one big go. Why do we do it like this? Well, because we're a tiled architecture. The idea is that we want to do perform all of the fragment work for a tile in one go so we can do a bunch of optimizations. Primarily, we can keep a bunch of intermediate data in tile memory and save a whole bunch of bandwidth. And if you save bandwidth, you save power, which means your battery lasts longer and you don't need to wear oven mitts to game on your phone. So that sounds great, but it does come with some drawbacks as well, this kind of scheduling. Uh, while we are doing that massive chunk of vertex work, our texturing unit is probably sitting there busy twiddling its thumbs, not doing anything, because you're not sampling a lot of textures in your vertex shader, probably. Uh, then when we're doing our fragment shader, our texturing unit is real busy, but other aspects of the GPU aren't utilized quite so much. Because vertex and fragment work tend to stress different aspects of the GPU. What we would really like to do, if we could choose, is to do vertex and fragment work in parallel. That way we get, we get full GPU utilization and everything would be great. But we can't. We can't do the fragment work before we've done vertex shading. That's just not possible. But what we can do is this. We can do, while we are doing fragment work for the first render pass, we can start on the vertex work for the second render pass already. Then we can execute them in parallel. We get full U GPU utilization and just look at all that nice frame time we just saved. Nice. But ho hold on a minute. That second render pass samples the shadow map that we rendered in the first render pass. So that's a dependency. We need a barrier. <laughs> Fortunately, Don has been kind enough to introduce a barrier for us. So let's have a look at it. Well, we're rendering to a shadow map. So we're rendering a depth buffer. So the source stages should be late fragment tests. That's where we write out the depth data. And then in the second render pass, we're sampling it when we do the lighting in the fragment shader. So the destination stages should be the fragment shader. And this is what our barrier looks like. It doesn't really do a whole lot. Our execution looks exactly identical to before. Uh, but we still need it because there was an image layout transition and you know we want to avoid cache issues, make sure we're not reading old data. So we need it there. But everything looks fine. But I just showed you what happened when you sampled a texture in WebGPU. We didn't insert a pipeline barrier like this. We inserted all of these stages. So actually, our barrier looks a little bit more like this, which means our scheduling looks like this. And we just lost all of that nice utilization, all that nice overlap, and all of that nice frame time we just saved. And it's entirely unnecessary, because there is no actual fragment to vertex dependency here. There's no reason we can't execute these things in parallel. It's just because we inserted a bad barrier that didn't actually reflect the needs of the application. So let's fix it. So let's remember what the actual issue was. When we were inserting our barrier, we needed to know which pipeline stage to insert. And we didn't know if it was vertex, fragment, or compute, so we just did all of them. What if? instead of only having a usage flag, we also had the shader stages that the resource is being used in. That way, it would be trivial to know which pipeline stage to insert. It's the texture. It's being sampled in shader. Which shader? The fragment shader. So it's pipeline stage fragment shader bit. So how do we do that? Well, the reason we only have the usage mask is because that's the only thing we were tracking in our sync scope. So let's add in the shader stages. So instead of only tracking a list of every resource that is being used and how it was used, we'll also track in which shader stage it was being used. And not every usage corresponds to a shader stage. Some usage occurs outside of shaders, so then we'll just put shader stage none. But this raises the question, how do we know which shader stages a resource is used in? And for your engine, there may be multiple answers to this question. You may have some kind of explicit tagging, some kind of hint system, or you may want to do shader analysis to get some reflection info back and do it that way. In our case, it's actually way easier than that. The user has already told us 
Because in WebGPU, when you create a bind group layout, you have to specify which shader stages is this resource actually being used in. So we already have this visibility mask. Let's just use it. So now we know which shader stage our resource is used in, which means we can track it in our sync scope, which means we can go from this line of code, get pipeline stage based off usage, to this line of code, get pipeline stage based off of usage and shader stages. So let's return to our barrier and see what happened. We previously inserted every pipeline stage that is supported. Now we know that it's only used in the fragment shader, so we can insert it only for the fragment shader. And our pipeline barrier now goes to looking like this, which means our scheduling goes back to looking like this. And we get nice utilization again, and we just saved all of that nice frame time. How much frame time do we save exactly? Well, I measured the examples, uh, an example application for this on an Immortalis G715 device. On the left, we can see the baseline before any of the optimizations, where we just get the pipeline stage based on the usage flag. And on the right, we have after doing the optimizations, where we get the pipeline stage not only based on the usage, but also with knowledge about the shader stages. And we're saving 15% on our frame times. And this is exactly the same application, rendering exactly the same content in exactly the same way. The only thing that has changed is the pipeline barriers. But of course, because pipeline barriers affect your scheduling, that can have a massive impact on your performance. And actually, I lied a little bit here, because there is one more difference here. It's not only the difference between get pipeline stage based on usage and based on shader stage. Uh, I've made one more uh, major optimization. So remember when I said, when we begun our render pass, we would loop through every single resource and introduce a pipeline barrier. Well, that's potentially a lot of resources, probably like more than three or something, uh, maybe hundreds, maybe even more than that. Do we really need hundreds of pipeline barriers? Uh, fortunately, we don't need to. Uh, that would be a lot of pipeline barriers. But fortunately, a pipeline barrier can contain any number of memory barriers. So let's just merge all of them into one. This is quite simple to do. Let's take an example where we merge two barriers. And if you can merge two, then you can merge 100. So the first barrier concerns a uh, uniform buffer that contains some matrices. It's being read in the vertex shader. And previously, we wrote to it in some transfer stage. So it's a transfer to vertex barrier. The second barrier concerns some image that we render to. And then we are sampling it in the fragment shader. So it's a fragment to fragment barrier. Technically, it should be color attachment output to fragment. But I wrote fragment to fragment for the sake of simplicity. So the way we're going to merge them together is bitwise or. Just bitwise or together all of the source stages, bitwise or together all of the destination stages, and we get the merged barrier. But boom, bada bing, simple. So we get transfer and fragment to vertex and fragment. And this is the way that barrier merging used to work in Dawn. But there is a problem. If we look a little bit closer, we see that we are in this barrier expressing that there's a fragment to vertex dependency. But there wasn't. Where did that come from? We had a transfer to vertex dependency and a fragment to fragment dependency. We didn't have a fragment to vertex dependency. That just appeared all out of thin air when we merged together the barriers. So you need to be careful when merging barriers so you don't introduce dependencies that don't actually exist. And the way to solve this is actually pretty simple. Instead of merging every memory barrier into a single pipeline barrier, we're just going to merge them into two pipeline barriers. The first pipeline barrier is going to cover every memory barrier that has vertex in its destination sta stage mask or any other early pipeline stage. And the second pipeline barrier is just everything else. And as long as you do this, you're not going to inadvertently introduce a barrier between a late stage and an early stage that you didn't intend to be there. Or alternatively, you can just use synchronization 2 because in synchronization two, you specify the pipeline stages individually for each um, memory barrier, which means you don't need to do this bitwise or merging, and you don't get the problem in the first place. 
So if there's one conclusion I want you to get away from this presentation, it's if this code, if this single line of codes exists anywhere in your code base, maybe consider rewriting it to also consider the shader stages. Doing this change may just save you 15% on your frame times if you're running on a tiled architecture. Obviously, that's a little bit easier said than done, because uh, sure, it's a one line change, but there's a couple more lines of changes to be able to do that. Uh, but still, you know, 15% for essentially changing the values of the bit mask, not bad. You have some resources to help you with synchronization. Uh, there are the synchronization validation layers that can help you catch invalid usage. Um, we had to talk about that yesterday. And for those watching online later, you can check out that talk. If you are writing synchronization code and you are getting rendering artifacts, use the validation layers to spot where you went wrong. If you are not getting rendering artifacts, use the validation layers to see where you went wrong. <laughs> Because just because it looks like it working doesn't mean it is. This is synchronization. This is timing issues and cache issues. All bets are off. Works on my machine is not good enough. Secondly, we have the Vulkan samples, which contains a pipeline barrier sample. In this sample, you can see the difference between an all-to-all -all barrier, a fragment-to-vertex barrier, and a fragment-to-fragment -fragment barrier basically barriers that are nice and play nicely and barriers that would break uh, the scheduling. And you can switch between these at runtime and see what impact on performance you get if you want to see some numbers for yourself. And finally, I had to simplify a couple of things to fit this in a 30 minute talk. I can go on for hours talking about Vulcan synchronization and maybe at some point I will. Uh, but if you want to see all of the full details of the Don commit that did this optimizations and saved 15%, uh, you can check out the patch over here. Um, a lot of the, the underlying details mirror a lot of the stuff that Gregory done in his talk. So also check that talk out. And finally, I would like you to consider, if you haven't already, to join the ARM developer program where you can get access to ARM experts where you can, for instance, ask questions about Vulcan synchronization. Speaking of, do we have some questions about Vulcan synchronization? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so uh, I had a question about synchronization two. So if we're using synchronization two, I was wondering if you could speak to whether it still makes sense to keep merging barriers or we can just you know shoot out this stream of barriers for individual resources and uh, you know let the implementation handle it in the most optimal way that it sees fit. So you would still like to merge barriers in the sense that you have one pipeline barrier call instead of right. hundreds of them, right? But uh, you can just add all of your memory barriers into you know that long list in the pipeline barrier. So as long as you have a single pipeline barrier call, then the optimization can go through and optimize. One more question. Thanks for your great talk and for your great Dawn contribution. Uh, can you talk a little bit about any tools that you used to like look at, you know, frame traces and see, hey, here's a big pipeline bubble and you should consider going after this next? Yeah, so for correctness, as I mentioned, the validation layers, use them. They will help you. Uh, they help there to identify some edge cases where the edge cases in the API were that we have to handle. Uh, in terms of profiling tools to determine bubbles, I wish <laughs> I had some really great tool I could recommend. Uh, unfortunately, that's in the Android ecosystem where we are struggling a bit. Uh, there is Streamline, uh, which now has this timeline feature where you can see the execution of different render passes and see the, if they're overlapping or not. Um, I would like to heartily recommend that. Unfortunately, this feature is only available on the very, very latest drivers, as in maybe mobile phones released yesterday uh, or something. So unfortunately, it's not really widely available right now, but I, I'm really excited about that for the future. So hopefully the tooling should get a lot better in the future. So um, 
I'm watching the talks, and um, y'all seem to be using pipeline barriers. I is there something wrong with uh, events? Are they useless? Are they uh, worse performance than pipeline? I mean, because I mean, it's supposed to be a split barrier, so should we not use them or something? So uh, watch this space in the future. Uh, that is something I am experimenting with uh, right now, implementing events instead of pipeline barriers and seeing what happens. Uh, there are some challenges there. And events, in theory, allow you to express some dependency with much better granularity, which can allow better scheduling. But there are also some drawbacks in that events tend to come with some higher overhead than pipeline barriers in some cases. And in cases like this, I mean, ideally, you would use events for any case where you need that higher granularity and fall back to pipeline barriers whenever you don't. That would be the very best possible uh, and most optimized way to do it. That's a lot harder said than done, because usually you don't know, know until later whether it would have been better with a pipeline barrier or an event. So either you implement everything with events or everything with pipeline barriers. Uh, so it's unless you have a time machine, then uh, but yeah, it is tricky. Um, I am hoping to do more with events in the future and see, you know, what is the uh, trade-off between the better scheduling versus the higher overhead, and when is it worth it? But the current implementation that I optimized was using pipeline barriers, so I optimized that. All right. I believe we have one question remaining. A dumb question. Um, so you implied that synchronization two was kind of the second choice. And uh, I get it that Dawn has to run on absolutely everything. Um, but do you have a gut feel for like synchronization two penetration? Is there some point at which we can, if we're not writing Dawn, at which point we can forget about implementations that don't support synchronization two? I mean, there is a layer as well. So yeah, so as Gregor mentioned, where places where you don't have synchronization to, you do have the layer that can help you. Uh, in our case, all of the existing code base was synchronization one, so it's not really much of a choice on my side. Uh, I don't know how wide penetration of synchronization two is, so fortunately, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> 